This week, is 5G really a health hazard? Weather forecasting in danger? And back in time to the Berlin Wall. Towns and cities across the UK, a tech revolution is slowly being born, one antenna at a time. Bit by bit, 5G is becoming a thing. And while all the infrastructure might look a bit dull, we'll take a look at this. This is a speed test to this phone, which right now is getting data speeds of 390 megabits per second. Not bad. Yeah, this new network is going to be so fast that we'll be able to download in a heartbeat and stream video to multiple devices at once. In order to allow this to properly take off with high speed and minimal delay, we're going to see lots of new antennas, each serving small areas. And some of them may use much higher frequency radio waves than previous mobile networks. But having these antennas everywhere has given some people pause for thought. They believe that 5G radio waves can cause health problems and they're campaigning for the rollout to be halted. Now, this protest group is small but vocal and it does seem to be growing. So Paul Carter went to Brighton to meet some of the anti-5G movement. Hove, near Brighton. Say no to 5G! Say no to 5G! It may not be the first place that comes to mind when thinking of the front line of protest. Prove that it's safe! But campaigners here are making their feelings known about plans to introduce 5G masts in the area. What do we want? A ban! When do we want it? Now! The World Health Organization, Public Health England and the NHS all say there is no sufficient evidence to say 5G poses a risk to health. However, that has done little to placate campaigners. Earlier this year, one parliamentary petition calling for more research into 5G attracted more than 29,000 signatures. So what are their concerns? Public Health England and the government say that 5G and electromagnetic frequencies are safe because they all fall underneath the level of the international safety guidelines. However, um, there are huge issues with the safety guidelines. There's a great big gaping black hole. What the safety guidelines will tell you is whether the, your mast will burn or heat you, but what it won't tell you is all of these health effects that are known by science to uh, be linked to electromagnetic frequency radiation. Who decides who's guinea pigs? Who's deciding to, you know, to roll this out and test it on, on who? who? Who are going to be the lab rats, the, the lab mice, whatever you want to call us, because it's not safety tested. If someone said to me, fact, 5G is safe. If our government came to me and said, fact, 5G is safe. Fact, it's been tested by the telecoms industry. I wouldn't probably have the concerns that I have, but to me, there's no fact there from them. The industry, however, have a very different view. Campaigners will say 5G hasn't been tested, and if it's not been tested, it shouldn't be rolled out. What do you say to that? Now, I hear that, that line a lot, and it fundamentally misunderstands what 5G is. Um, 5G uses technologies that have been in use in, in, in all countries for decades now. The type of frequencies that they use, the radio waves that they're using, they're the same ballpark of radio waves that have been used and tested and tested and tested for decades. Um, the, technology, the, the, the technology that goes into the antennas doesn't fundamentally change the way that those radio waves behave. So whilst it looks and feels like a brand new technology from a marketing perspective, its roots are actually you know, in, inherent mobile radio technology that's been tested and used for decades now. What is happening here is very similar 
to the smoking. The actual health effects, the actual science were hidden and this is exactly what is happening here. 5G is, is highly, highly unlikely to cause more cancers than 2 to 4G and there isn't much evidence of, in, of increased risk for 2 to 4G, if any. It is not the new tobacco, it is not the new asbestos. Uh, that just simply isn't true. But despite the weight of scientific evidence, the anti-5G movement is growing. Similar groups have been popping up in other areas around the world, fueled by social media and the internet. Back in Hove, the campaigners had the opportunity to present their concerns to councillors. Exposure to 5G radiation will be 24-7, 365 days a year without our informed consent. Nationally, Public Health England provide the expert advice on public health matters associated with radio frequency, electromagnetic fields or radio waves used in telecommunications. The implementation and regulation of 5G technology is a national responsibility. Is there anything from this point that they could say that would convince you that this is safe? Yeah, they could put their case, but the independent scientists and the actual science needs to be properly heard as well. Ultimately, is this a battle you can actually win? <laughs> um, there will always be uh, a small number of, of individuals who, who do not want to hear from large corporations like us. And, and there will always be a huge group of people who, who, who don't have any concerns about this technology. There might be a group in the middle who could be swayed. And I think that's the group that, um, where, yeah, there is a battle to be won, if you like. We do need to make sure those people have access to the right information, that they can make an informed decision and not be misled by what is some pretty aggressive scaremongering. That was Howard Jones talking to Paul Carter. And to try and address the concerns of those who may still be undecided, we've come to this rooftop in London to take some measurements from a 5G transmitter. And we've drafted in some independent experts to help. Dr Richard Findlay is an electromagnetic field safety specialist and he's going to be measuring the strength and frequency of the radio waves at different distances from the mast. So first we're going to put the probe right up on the the middle of the transmitter? Yes, okay, that's right. Let's go for it. So in the middle, come up down. And your maximum reading was? 550. 551.6%. So basically, if you were to strap yourself to that transmitter, three metres up there, you'd be getting five times the guidelines? Yes, you'd be overexposed. Okay, but no one's going to do that? No. Okay, so shall we go over there, which is, what, what would you say, there's two or three metres in that direction and see how the signal drops off? Yeah. There you go. Oh, wow. 14.5. So even over that distance, we've gone from... We've gone down by a factor of, of, of <laughs> what is that? That's 50, more than yeah, 50 times? Yeah, 550 down to 14.5. Okay, so down to less than a fifth of the government safety guidelines. Yes. Right, time to try and make sense of those readings with physicist and cancer researcher David Grimes. So we've seen there that the power drops off really, really quickly as you move away from the transmitter. Absolutely, and that's what you'd expect. As you get further and further away from a source of light, which of course radio frequency really is, even if we can't see it, the drop off is really, really rapid. And by the time you're uh, you know, even an appreciable distance away from any kind of transmitter, it's way more likely that your phone itself is going to be emitting a lot more than any of these transmitters are. Do you think one of the worries about 5G is that there's talk of using higher frequency radio waves? I think so, absolutely. I think people have an intuitive understanding that higher frequency is higher energy. But I think what people really need to be aware of is that this kind of radiation is still very, very non-ionizing. What that means is it doesn't have the fundamental energy to liberate an electron and cause damage. If you want to cause, say, cancers and things like that, you typically need to cause that kind of DNA damage. And the new 5G spectrum is 
very low energy. It's much lower energy than, say, visible light. But more than that, the biophysics itself, the, uh, the, the mechanics of how you might develop a cancer or something, we know that this kind of radiation is non-ionizing. It cannot cause the level of DNA damage that you typically expect or need to cause a cancer. And so for that reason, the combination of epidemiological evidence and biophysical evidence, we don't have any current cause for concern. That being said, it's always good to observe and keep an eye on trends to see what might emerge, but we don't expect anything will. So there you go, some real science which I hope has helped you to understand how safe 5G signals are. And just for extra information, we're now taking a reading at head level here on the roof, right next to the 5G transmitter. And the number is kind of bouncing around the 2% mark. So even if you're walking on a rooftop next to a 5G transmitter as we are, you're still 50 times below the recommended safety level. Hello and welcome to The Week in Tech. It was the week that the US National Transportation Safety Board flagged software flaws in the self-driving Uber that killed a woman in Arizona last year. It said the car failed to properly identify her as a pedestrian while she had been walking with a bike across a poorly lit road. American and Japanese researchers have used beams of light to hack Google Home, Amazon Echo and Apple HomePod devices in a bid to expose security and privacy risks. A laser managed to take control of one of the devices from over 30 metres away. And UK drone pilots have until the end of November to register their details with the Civil Aviation Authority or face penalty fines. US researchers say they've printed skin that's alive and even has working blood vessels. Scientists combine cells that kickstart blood vessel development with animal collagen. All of this is happening inside 3D printed tissue. This could potentially deliver better skin grafts to burns patients. And finally, Harvard researchers have revealed their urchin bot, complete with waggly tentacles. The amphibious robot uses pumps, valves and magnets to move and could be useful in ocean cleanups. It's a touch sluggish though, with a top speed of 6 millimetres per second. A pilgrimage for creativity. Each year in LA, 15,000 artists, designers and storytellers flock to Adobe Max to discover the latest tools they'll have to mix into their creative palettes. While we humans still fire the imaginative sparks, increasingly it's the guiding hand of machines doing the heavy lifting, from intuitively understanding the parts of an image we want to manipulate, to repainting a single frame of video, and letting Adobe's AI platform Sensei apply it to the entire scene. Unlike the somewhat dystopian future depicted in the movies, Adobe isn't too worried about a landscape dominated by AI. In fact, they're betting the farm on it, alongside another emerging technology, augmented reality. The potential for digital overlays to truly enhance our real world, and yes, even cardboard movie sets, is creating feverish buzz. After all, AR doesn't invoke the same fears as AI and its Terminator-esque machines. But while futuristic AR demos are seductive, actually creating these enhanced environments has been beyond the wit of most of us neophytes. Okay. Enter Adobe Aero, a free iPad app making content creation relatively straightforward. Uh, I'm just using normal everyday gestures. There's still the challenge though of finding some decent glasses to eye up our new world and not just peer at it through our phones or tablets. But Adobe's confidence is unwavering. AR bridges the physical and digital worlds and truly has the potential to be bigger than the web. Scott, you made a very bold claim at the keynote. Back it up. Well, if you think about it, the web is something we have to go to. And we only go to it when we feel like we need something. But AR is always going to be there in permeating our everyday life when we don't know we need it. So for example, in your bathroom, every pill bottle has like information on top of it and, and every food has like calorie counts and whatever else. I mean, there's gonna be layers of augmented reality and they're gonna be everywhere all the time. A peek into Adobe's R&D also reveals its firm belief in AI. 
Here it's being used to blend a bird's sketch with a real bird's texture to create something entirely new. And this research prototype shows how you can easily animate the mouth of a flat image to the words in an audio file. Our technology works with any image, photo cool? or sketch. But it's clear that such bleeding edge creative products can and potentially like that, be more sinister. In this post-truth era, deep fake photos and videos are becoming a serious challenge online, where politicians, celebrities or even ex-girlfriends can be made out to say or do things they never actually said or did. To combat this, Adobe has launched a system that records exactly which changes were made to images, when and by whom, so that a viewer can see an authenticated breadcrumb trail of edits. Technology alone cannot solve this. You actually really need multitude of pieces to come together. We have a role to play as a technology player. These distribution platforms and media platforms have a role to play. But frankly, creators also have a role to play. I think content authentication is definitely important and it's definitely in its very first stages. The very fact that they've got the New York Times and Twitter involved is a very good start, but it's got a long way to go and nobody really knows how it will take shape. One thing we do know is that AI is here to stay, whether we like it or not. So we've been talking about the problems that 5G radio signals may or may not cause. And while we've established that they don't damage our health, they may actually cause other problems in very surprising areas. Some scientists are concerned that 5G could affect our ability to predict the weather, specifically hurricanes and other extreme events. They say it could set forecasting back to the 1980s. Peter Gibbs, a professional meteorologist for nearly 40 years, has been finding out why. In 2018, the Federal Communications Commission, or FCC, in the US auctioned off part of their radio spectrum, or a bunch of frequencies, to telecommunications companies for use on the 5G network. What's that got to do with weather? Andrew Friedman at the Washington Post has been following this story from the start. So the background really is that scientists have figured out that 5G equipment, uh, that telecommunication companies want to deploy, particularly in cities, uh, may actually interfere with signals that are bouncing out of satellites in space into Earth's atmosphere and back to sense uh, a very important component uh, for making weather forecasts. So let's try and explain the problem. And bear in mind, I am a scientist, not an artist, so bear with me, OK? So what weather satellites are looking for when they monitor the atmosphere is microwave transmissions. And they're coming from things like clouds, from snow, from rain, from water vapour as well. Very faint microwave signals at very precise frequencies. So, for example, here's a little water vapour molecule. It's vibrating away at 23.8 gigahertz. Right next to that frequency, is 24 gigahertz, which is one of the ones that's been auctioned off for use in 5G. Now, you can't just ask that little molecule to tune out of the way. And that's the fundamental problem. That's why weather scientists are really worried. Looks like they're about to get some rather noisy neighbours. If they're broadcasting loudly in the house next door, or in our case, in the frequency band next door, even if what they're leaking is quite a small amount of their power, it can still be much larger than what we're trying to measure. We're going to be in a very difficult world where you know, we're not necessarily sure what we're measuring anymore. Are we measuring interference? Are we measuring the signal? That's, that's the worst fear. The complex weather models used in today's forecasts need satellite data on a global scale. A storm now hitting Europe might have started life days earlier in North America. The World Meteorological Organization in Geneva, Switzerland, organizes that exchange of data, and they're worried a reduction in quality could have real-life consequences, consequences that could have been avoided. If we don't have this specific measurement, in fact, we will lose three to six hours to inform population of the risk of a special events, meteorological special events. 
like floods, flash floods or storms or things like that. So the scientists are really worried. The US regulators don't seem to think there's that much of an issue, while one representative of the telecoms companies has actually called the scientists' fears absurd. The telecom companies have aggressively pushed back at the scientific agencies and said, we don't think that your analyses are correct. We actually think that this is something that uh, isn't such a big deal and that even if it's a big deal, we can solve this some other way. Although the science community has said they're not against 5G because the benefits are clear, they've tried to engage with the telecom companies about potential interference, so far without much response. I know that there is one company um, that, that really could benefit a great deal from 5G because they promote weather apps. Of course, weather companies want 5G. But the thing is, is that they are opposed to this issue because they're like, well, what's the use of having a new faster app if we have inaccurate information? 5G is coming and it'll no doubt bring lots of benefits. But we're living in a time of rapidly changing climate where severe weather is becoming more frequent and more dangerous. We need to be able to predict and warn of these events. It's never been more important. That was Peter Gibbs. And just to add that meteorologists from around the world are meeting right now at the World Radio Communications Conference to discuss this very issue. So we'll keep you posted. On the 9th of November, it'll be 30 years since the fall of the Berlin Wall. It acted as a physical barrier throughout Berlin, but it was also a symbol of the divide between communism and capitalism. Now, virtual reality is being used to bring the past to life. YouTube Originals and Remarkable TV have worked with descendants of those who experienced the rise and the fall of the wall, allowing them to step inside photographs and be transported back to virtual recreations of their family's stories. Well, uh, there's a famous uh, photograph of uh, my grandma, Elke Rosin, uh, where she was just able to escape from the wall being built last minute. I don't think people really realise that the wall was something that evolved over time. So in 1961, it started out just as barbed wire that was laid out across the street. Fast forward 20 years into the future, and it's a completely militarised border. So to be able to use VR to chart that evolution and sort of plant yourself in front of the wall and be there through that iteration felt like quite a powerful thing to do. There's a huge potential in factual storytelling, and it feels like we are on the sort of cusp if you like, of a new way of engaging people in history, a new way of engaging people in documentary. Well, my grandfather is one of the builders of the Tunnel 57. Seeing my grandfather dig in the tunnel was really weird. I mean, like, back when he was doing that, he was probably around my age. He was so close to me in that moment that I was actually like, I would have loved to talk to him about, you want to go get a beer later or anything like that. That is just a taster. If you want to watch our full report on how virtual reality has brought these remarkable stories to life, follow the link below to the BBC News website. And that's it from us for this week. Don't forget you can find us all across social media throughout the week on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube and Twitter at BBC Click. Thanks for watching and we'll see you soon.